Hi there folks, Tim Slade here from Artisan eLearning and eLearningUncovered.com and uh, in today's webinar we're going to be talking about uh, user interface design uh, specifically for eLearning. Uh, I guess the formal uh, title of my presentation is, is uh, don't let your uh, user interface or don't let your interface get in the way of your user three rules for designing effective e-learning user interfaces and before I jump right in uh, let me mention of course you can always follow me on Twitter uh, at Slade Tim and uh, you can also find me at elearninguncovered.com so let's jump right in so the idea of user interface design as it relates to e-learning is a really interesting concept and uh, user interface design for e-learning is something that for a lot of people is really new for us uh, if you're like me you know, when I got into e-learning, I didn't grow up of uh, dreaming to be an e-learning designer, and I didn't go to school or college to be an e-learning designer. And that's true for most of us who work in this industry. Uh, we were either uh, uh, really good at something and then we fell into a training role, or we were classroom trainers or instructional designers, and, uh, you know, over the course of time, we fell into e-learning. And so the whole concept of e-learning design and more specifically user interface design is something that's really foreign to a lot of us um, in the industry. And the reason why that is, is for a lot of us who, who have been working in e-learning relatively recently, many of us started um, by working with a, a PowerPoint conversion tool, whether it be Articulate Studio or some other program where you are taking PowerPoint slides and converting them into an e-learning course. And so the whole concept of thinking about user interface design is something many of us never even need to, needed to worry about when we first started out in e-learning. And the reason why that is, is these PowerPoint conversion tools would take your PowerPoint slide and encapsulate it in this player. And the player was actually the user interface. And you didn't have to worry about um, making the user interface work or worry about um, whether it was intuitive or not because the player was the player and there was only so much you can change with the player whether it be the colors or the menu or whatnot and so nowadays um, we're moving into e-learning where we can do a little bit more and we don't have you know before we didn't have to worry about this because the player and the slide was always two independent separate things you only had to worry about the slide the player took care of itself if you will but nowadays we're moving into uh, or we have the ability to create e-learning content that uh, we can we can just get rid of the player altogether and put all of our course controls on the screen whether that's having the user type in information or having the actual buttons and controls on the screen for the user to interact with the course you don't even need a player nowadays to create a really interactive e-learning course and so this is a very foreign concept for many of us because even though many we can't always define it, we really are starting to move into the world of being user interface designers on top of being graphic designers, e-learning designers, instructional designers, and all that other uh, stuff that, that can challenge us. But user interface design is something that, that we're having to uh, be more cognizant of than we ever had to before. And this is even getting more complicated nowadays <clears throat> with the um, the use of mobile devices. Now, not only do you have to worry about your user interface and how it's presented to the learner on a computer, we also have to worry about how it's presented to the learner on an iPad or maybe an iPhone or maybe other some other sort of uh, type of device. And so it can really, you know, muddy the waters in terms of all of the different variables that we have to take into account for creating a succinct and usable interface for our learners. Um, one of the things that we are really good about doing in the e-learning world is treating our learners like they're stupid. Uh, we will go above and beyond to make the course um, as easy to use or we think we're making it easy to use by adding all of these additional controls and features um, so that we can try and cater to every type of person and we're trying to cater to the lowest common denominator of user and uh, we just treat people like they're stupid and and I really believe it's a it's the opposite I think our our learners are actually really savvy um, <clears throat> most of them are savvy and and they know how to use a computer and I always um, there's this quote or there was this this um, talk that Johnny Ive from Apple gave and he uh, 
he said, you know, when you eat a bad piece of food, you don't assume uh, there's something wrong with your interpretation of that food. You just assume, hey, this is a bad piece of food. You don't think there's something wrong with your taste buds or something about the way you're tasting the food. The food's just bad. Uh, but when you interact with a user interface that you are struggling with or doesn't make sense, you don't, most learners or most people don't go, gosh, this is just a horribly designed user interface. We don't think on those terms. Uh, in reality, people think there's something wrong with their ability to use that program or use that interface. And so we're much harsher on ourselves when we can't understand, or our learners are much harsher on themselves when they can't understand how to use our courses. Uh, they think there's something wrong with their interpretation of that. And you never want to create that experience for learners. You want it to be easy um, to use, and you don't want them to have to think about how to use it. I always believe that courses are built uh, in layers uh, from a graphic design and user interface standpoint. They're built in layers. You have the course here, and you have a background, and you have an interface layer, and then a content layer. And I think that the interface and content layers should be of equal importance. And what we tend to do is we tend to put all of our effort into the content because content is king. Obviously, content has to be um, it has to be perfect. But uh, what we do is we put so much time into content that we leave very little time or energy for mastering our interface or our graphic design, and that ends up suffering. And so I think content in the interface and the graphics, they all need to have equal importance when you're creating an e-learning course. The reason why that is, is because you want the user to be able to access your content. And the whole purpose of a user interface, and graphic design even, is to elevate your content so that the learner can access it. What happens is when we don't put enough time into developing a really good user interface, or we don't put enough time into developing really good graphics, what you ultimately end up doing is you end up blocking the user's access to that content. And before you know it, they can't even see the content anymore through your bad user interface. They're distracted and they can't access your content, which completely, um, uh, completely defeats the purpose of creating an e-learning course. I love this image. I saw this image on LinkedIn and I, I took a screenshot of it real quickly. Um, and this image represents uh, the difference between how we design things and what people actually do. You know, you look at this trail here and I have to assume they built this little barricade here to prevent people from just jutting out into the road. You have to go through this little gateway on the right hand side and then continue walking through rather than just speeding on through and maybe getting hit by a car. And although the intention is, um, is, is meant to protect the bike rider, what ultimately happens is people just find ways to go around your intentions. Uh, they just go around and you can see where they've actually created their own trail uh, to figure out how to go around your, the, the, the designed experience, if you will. And the same thing can happen with our e-learning courses. Not to say that people can just break your course and go around, you know, go around it if you have it locked down, but they might just ignore your content. They uh, might just sit there and click everything on the screen so they can continue on to the next screen or continue to the end and not actually listen to uh, your content. Um, and so there's a big difference between our intent on how we design things and what reality, what the reality is for the learner. So for this presentation, I have three tips, ideas, philosophies, ideologies, whatever you want to call it. I have these three tips for designing a really good user interface. And these are tips, These let me say this, they're not the end-all be-all by any means, uh, but these are three things that I have identified for myself that I think are really, really important um, when designing a really effective user interface. The first one is removing redundant navigation and being consistent. This is the one thing that I think we're really, really bad about doing. We tend to create a lot of redundancy and we tend to be very inconsistent uh, with our user interface and our design. Um, and I have a kind of a weird story to illustrate this. Uh, before I got into e-learning, um, and I've only been working in e-learning since 2009, so relatively a short time. Uh, before I got into e-learning, 
I worked in retail loss prevention. And for those of you who don't know what retail loss prevention is, uh, my job was essentially to catch shoplifters. I was like a glorified mall cop. And uh, I loved it. It's the best job in the world. Catching shoplifters is the most adren adrenaline rushing job you can ever have. And I worked for Kohl's and Dillard's and Macy's and several other retailers. And the thing about catching shoplifters is I loved it. I loved catching shoplifters. I loved catching shoplifters so much that when somebody would come into the store and I thought that they were going to steal, I would get actually really disappointed when they would go to the register to purchase the merchandise, which I know is sort of a backwards uh, mentality. But uh, my job was to catch shoplifters, and that's what I wanted people to do was steal so I could catch them. And uh, what I realized is that if I really, really wanted that shoplifter to steal, I had to make myself invisible to them. If the shoplifter or the potential shoplifter knew I was there and didn't feel safe, if you will, in the act of shoplifting, they wouldn't shoplift. Uh, it would ultimately deter them. So I had to make myself almost invisible to that shoplifter. And it's sort of the same thing with user interface design. If you make your user interface too abrupt or uh, too confusing to use, you almost block the user from being able to reach their goal of obtaining that content. Uh, so you almost have to make your user interface uh, subtle in the sense that it doesn't block the user from actually receiving that content, absorbing it, and assimilating it so that they can use it um, once they're done exiting your course. So what we need to do is we need to remove controls that accomplish the same thing. Like I said, we do this all the time. Um, we assume people are stupid, <laughs> some of our learners, and so what we do, or we assume that they're not going to be able to figure out how to use the course, and so what we do is we add all of these extra controls to the screen, thinking, oh, this will help them because there's more than one way to do the same thing, and then what we ultimately end up doing is making it more confusing for them to do the one thing that you want them to do. The thing about redundancy is there's examples of redundancy everywhere in our lives, and this is one of uh, my favorite examples that I've noticed recently. I was at a, um, a home a home store where they sold appliances, and I saw this fridge. And the thing about this fridge is you have a door, like all fridges, to get into the fridge, but then you have another door attached to the outside of the door to get into the fridge. And <laughs> this is just besides it being like a total first world problem that you need to have a smaller door to get into the fridge just to be more convenient it's just it's just ridiculous redundancy to have to have two doors on a door it's just more things that could be broken right and so we have redundancy everywhere in our lives here's one of my favorite examples um, this is a course or a slide that was built in articulate studio 09 and this is specifically an engage interaction and i always love showing this because there's so many examples of redundancy. When you look at the slide, you know, there's so many controls to move forward that you're almost overwhelmed. You can move forward by clicking on one of these buttons down here, or there's these buttons up here, or these buttons down here. And if I'm a learner, I might be a little confused about what is going to do what. Now, as the, the designer, we know what each control is going to do, and we know what we want the learner to do, but we assume that that's somehow transmitted to the learner through, I don't know, uh, telepathy, that they know what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> and as a learner, uh, do is this going to take me to the next slide, or is it going to take me to the next step in the process? Will this take me to the next step or the next slide? Who knows? This is what I'm talking about when it can overwhelm the learner. And while I'm sitting here thinking about all of this as a learner, I'm not paying attention to what's most important, the content. And so this redundancy actually doesn't make it easier for the learner. It makes it more confusing and challenging to focus on the content. Another example of redundancy on this slide, and I, I, I cropped this image too, uh, too much, but there's, this is actually a volume control here. And it's the course volume control, and you'll notice there's another volume control up here where the user can adjust volume. Why have two things that do the same thing? I don't know. Another example of redundancy, this is a course built in Storyline. And on this slide, there's so many different things you can do. How do you progress to the next slide? Well, you can either click the next button or you can click this arrow button. It says click to begin, but I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to click. And of course, you have the menu here. You can always 
continue on through the menu. A few other things that are redundant, I would say this is more graphically redundant, but you have a title here and a title here. Um, you have this random logo here that you don't need. And so there's a lot of redundancy on this slide. And again, it's taking away my focus from starting the course and getting, getting the course going and learning the content. So if we remove those previous and next buttons, um, oh, another thing I got to mention about this, this previous slide is this is the very first slide in the project. So why have a previous button? Where are you going back to? There's nowhere to go back to. You should get rid of that. So if we get rid of the previous and next button, now you can hit this to go next, but you still have that menu. So what you can ultimately do is why not get rid of that menu? And you go, you might think, well, what if they want to navigate throughout the course? Well, build an on-screen menu like we have here. Here's an on-screen menu to take them through the three areas. So what you can do is ultimately get rid of the menu. And now you have a course where the user is actually focused what's on the screen and not on the player that's surrounding the screen. They can focus in on the content. Maintain consistency with location, function, and appearance. This is my last tip for, or my last uh, note regarding my first tip. Um, is consistency. You want to be consistent with how you design your course. If you have a button that looks a certain way, keep that button, make all your buttons look like that button. Um, and there's two different types of consistency I want to talk about, internal consistency and external consistency. Internal consistency are the standards or conventions that you apply within a single course. So like I said, if you create and design a button, your button should look like that button throughout your entire course. It's amazing, especially when you're first starting out with e-learning design, how if you're building a course over the, you know, over several weeks and you have 40 slides, you'll notice this design evolution from the beginning to the end. And that's those are things where as you were developing the course, you you figured out better ways to do things and what you didn't do is go back and fix the um, the first iterations of you know those early slides to make it consistent. The second type of consistency is external consistency. So standards or conventions that apply within multiple courses. So if you work in an organization um, where you typically lock down your courses, you should choose to lock down all of your courses. Be consistent with that decision. The reason why is if you lock down all of your courses and then all of a sudden you give the learner a course that they can navigate freely, well, do you think they're going to navigate freely or they're going to stick with what they already know? They'll stick with what they know and they will assume it's locked down. And it's vice versa. If you have your courses where the user can navigate freely, you should make all of your courses like that. Maybe not all, but most of them. So if you have a course where the user can navigate freely, or you have several courses like that, and then all of a sudden you throw out a course that where they can't navigate freely and it's locked down, that might confuse them. So you want to make sure you maintain that external consistency as well. So number two, encourage interaction and use states to provide instant feedback. And this is something that the marketing world has been using for uh, many years, and it's called a call to action. You want to invite the user to do something on the screen. You want to ask the user, hey, click the screen. You're going to get some more content, or you're going to be able to continue on when you do this. And when you invite the user to uh, interact with the screen, you're, you're giving them the opportunity to have control over their learning. And, and we know that that is very powerful in terms of a really good learning experience. So one of the ways we do that is we use states to indicate interactive objects. So when in the world, whenever you're interacting with a piece of technology or a user interface, whether it be on the internet or your phone or whatever it might be, when you interact with different buttons, you know that they're clickable or you know that they do something based off of how they change the way they look and feel depending on your interaction with them. So when you hover over a button, typically it should change its, the way it looks and feels. Um, same thing applies for e-learning. We have two buttons here on the screen. And if I hover over this, you know, nothing happens. I don't know that this button is interactive. However, if I hover over this one, Oh look, something changes about it, and based off of what I know about, um, you know, interacting with the world and different interfaces, I know, or I can safely assume, that this button is going to do something for me if I click on it. And so, the same thing applies for learners. They come to your course with expectations that they have learned subconsciously uh, throughout interacting with, you know, the everyday world. Here's a great example. We have 
Uh, this is a uh, Millennium Park in Chicago. And you have these three buttons on the screen. And as a designer, we know that those three buttons are interactive. But from a learner's perspective, they might only notice button two and say, well, button two is interactive. They don't know that buttons one and three, they might just be shapes on the screen. So we're inviting the user to take action based off of the way this button looks and feels. I click on it and, oh, hey, you know, it got my attention. The pulsing or the swirling animation invited me to take some sort of action with that item. I'll click on these as well, but I may not have known that otherwise. And again, you know that as a designer, but the learner does not know that. So you have to invite the user to take action. You have to get their attention. Here's another example. When you look at the screen, you know, based off of what you know, or based off what you can safely assume, what are you supposed to do here? Well, it seems pretty obvious. You have this uh, icon here that's kind of moving, and it's indicating to me that it's going to take me to the next screen. And I might be able to click on it. And if you click on it, it takes you to the next screen. So you come to courses with certain things that you've learned from the world around you, and you should design your courses to cater to that for your learners. Invite the user to take action with guided state changes. So there's also a lot we can communicate about the way our courses work based off the way buttons look and feel. For example, we have these three buttons here on the screen. They're all buttons, but based off the icon used on each button, we're communicating certain, um, we're communicating how the user can and cannot interact with them. So if it's normal or active, excuse me, maybe I can click on it. If it's completed, maybe it has a check mark. And if it has a lock icon, maybe it's disabled. There's simple little things like this, or it's simple little things like this that communicate to the learner how they can and cannot interact with different items on the screen. Here's a, an example of this in action. When you look at this tabbed interaction, these three steps, you know, what does it tell you about what you can and cannot do here? Well, I can't click on two or three, and I just know that based off of how it looks. I don't even need to attempt it. I just know that. But I can click on step one, and now I can see I'm on step one because that's how it, it's changed the way it looks and feels. But now step two is available to me. I know I can click on it because now it looks like step one did prior or previously. So I click on step two, and step one's been visited. Now I can go to step three. I've visited step two, and now I can continue on. So the way these buttons look and feel communicate a lot about what you can and cannot do in a course. Here's another example. You know, when you have more than maybe three or four items a user has to click on, you have to start providing some additional levels of communication to let the learner know what they have and have not viewed. Because what you end up having is, let's say you have 10 buttons the user needs to click before they can move forward. If you don't let the user know what they have and have not clicked, what you end up with is, is learners who, who, or are learners who just click on everything to move forward. So what you notice here is we have these five pulsing icons. I click on this one, and the, the state of the button changes to let me know, hey, you have visited that item. So I, don't, I know I don't need to go back and visit it again. And I know that I need to visit these two. And now I'm done, and I can move forward. There's no guessing about what I have and have not viewed. All right, number three, use transitions to ease learners into changing content. And this one is a, a hybrid between a user interface, um, between user interface design and what I would say graphic design or animation design. But we can use animations in our user interfaces to help ease learners into changing content. And what I mean by that is when it comes to having content on the screen and buttons on the screen, it's a lot for the learner to absorb. And so we can use animations to help make that transition from one slide to another easier for our learners. You can help the learner through the use of a transition or an animation, guide the learner from one point to another uh, without having or without forcing them to really think too much about it. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean. So you want to create a sense of visual continuity. So I mentioned earlier at the beginning of my presentation, I was talking about how courses are built in layers. And I had this really great example here on the screen where uh, this computer, when I clicked on it, all of the pieces of the computer kind of fanned out and you were able to see all of the layers I was talking about. Now, if I would have taken the same example and said, oh, you know, look, hey, you know, courses are built in layers and it would have just, you know, immediately gone to this, you may not have realized 
the point that I was trying to make. You would have to take a couple of moments to look at the screen and realize what exactly happened on the screen um, for it to end up this way. In contrast, however, if I were to take the same slide and add a simple animation to transition you from point A to point B, you don't have to think about what I'm talking about or the transition um, of information that is occurring. You are able to look at it and see um, where you were, where you were going, and, and how you got there. And so this, this makes it much easier for you to absorb that information as it happens. Here's a great example of this. This is a um, demonstration I built for an Articulate e-learning challenge talking about, uh, you know, it was, it was called Meet Apple's Leadership Team. And uh, I'll show you the before example first. You know, it looks beautiful from a graphic design standpoint. You can click on any one of these. Let's go see Tim Cook. You know, there's his picture. We have some information. That's great and awesome. Um, and it looks beautiful. That's great. However, and let me escape out of this here. However, if we look at the after example where I've included several animations, you can see that uh, the transitions and the movement um, makes it much easier for you to understand what's happening on the screen. So if we look at uh, Johnny Ive here, you'll see everything animates out and then his stuff animates in and it creates a, a building of information, if you will. You're able to see where you came from, where you're going, and ultimately how you got here. We go back, we look at Phil Schiller, same thing, everything builds out. All the new stuff builds in. So that's a simple example of these transi transitions in action. The next tip, uh, again, speaking to uh, these transitions, is you want to create a sense of visual hierarchy. How you have things build in and how you have things build out, um, and we're talking about your user interface and your content, can create a sense of visual hierarchy, and, and it can tell the learner what's important to be looking at at any given moment and what's not important to be looking at. Um, and here's a couple examples of uh, what I mean by this when it comes to building in and out animations. Um, if we look at this, this example up here, the green one, you'll notice that all of these items build in from top to bottom, left to right. And that's the direction they're taking. They're moving from left to right, top to bottom. And you're able to have a better sense of how those items are building in and where they're headed. Uh, in contrast, if you have something like this, they all kind of come in at the same time, and it's kind of abrupt. And even though the difference between these two animations are very subtle, um, being able to uh, be at ease with what's happening, it's easier when you're looking at this example up here to understand what's happening on the screen. And I'll show you some examples of this. This is a template that I built for the Articulate community, and I'm really proud of this template because it's become one of the most um, downloaded temp templates on the community. I think it has 10,000 plus downloads. And I was really um, struck by this because from a graphic design standpoint, it's really not all that amazing. You just have, you know, three colors, text, and a couple of simple shapes. So I had to, I had to ask myself, why is this so popular? And it's not because of the graphic design, but it's because of my use of animations, how I have things built in and out. And so let me show you an example without any animations, and then I'll show you one with animations. So here's that flat template. It looks great. We click to begin. Here's some learning objectives. We can read each of these. That's awesome. Hit continue. Now we have this, you know, timeline. Cool. That's awesome. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this um, as it is, but if we add animations to this, you'll be amazed at how much it really transforms uh, this template into something that's a lot more uh, engaging and a little bit uh, more um, just striking when you look at it. So here's one with uh, the animations. So everything builds in and you're able to process the information as it's building in. You're not just presented with all the information. It doesn't just hit you in the face. And a really good example of this is this next slide, the learning objective slide. In the previous example, the learning objective slide just showed you all the learning objectives. However, in this example, they each build in one at a time. So you get the opportunity to uh, absorb or assimilate each one one at a time. And of course, if there was audio narration, this would be synced up with audio narration. Uh, but it builds in, and so you get to absorb what's on the screen one piece at a time, rather than all at once. Same thing here. Everything builds out. The new stuff builds in. I have a better sense of what I can and cannot interact with. All, all in all, I have a better sense of what's on the screen. 
I, I'm much more comfortable with it because I got to see where I came from and how I got here. Everything animates out, the stuff animates in, and rinse and repeat, if you will. So you can use animations to really help learners um, transition from one thing to another. So that's my presentation. Uh, don't let your uh, interface get in the way of your user. Obviously, you want your interface to elevate uh, your learner, and, or not yet the learner, but your content, and make it accessible to the learner. Uh, you can follow me at Slade Tim on Twitter, and of course, check out all the cool stuff we're doing on elearninguncovered.com. And uh, I thank you for watching this webinar.